Go to analog. So Apollo 11 plus 50. So yes, next year, 2019, is the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, Apollo 11. So we're going to take a bit of a look at that uh, with our series we're calling Footsteps to the Moon, the Countdown to Apollo 11. So um, the series is going to be providing kind of real-time updates on a monthly basis uh, about what's happening between September of, 20, uh, of 1968 to July 1969. So we're going to be uh, having a bit of fun with that. We're going to have a quick look back at uh, earlier, before September 68, just to give a bit of a context of what's been going on. And then we'll come up to date tonight up to September 1968. Um, so we're going to be showing different parts of the program. I mean, there's so much was going on in that period of time that it's impossible to touch everything. So I've, I've just tried to grab a few unique things, maybe some things people haven't seen before, maybe some things people were involved with, I don't know. Uh, we've got a pretty diverse uh, people, bunch of people in the room. But anyway, we'll try to keep it fun and interesting. So then basically we're going to culminate uh, July of next year with the actual 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. We're going, I'm, I initially thought I'd try to do a parallel what was happening in the Soviet Union September of 68, et cetera, et cetera, what was happening in Australia. But I thought it's too hard to kind of track all that stuff because, you know, there's a lot going on. And back then in the Soviet Union, you really didn't have a good understanding of what was happening, when it was happening, and there wasn't much material, video, imagery available. So I'm going to try and make a couple of the, uh, the, the months just specialising on what the Soviet Union might be. And I might ask my friend Igor over here, who um, was actually there. Don't remember, he's been brainwashed. And he, we might do a, a presentation together, yeah. And, uh, and of course, there's, uh, there's a bunch of resources in Australia here talking about what happened in Australia and uh, some pretty uh, significant involvement from Australia in that program as well. So, um, so we're gonna look at the program. We're gonna start uh, back in 66, actually. So now, when we'll bring up today to September 68. So, are you ready? Strap in. We're going to the time machine. We are now in September of 1968. Oops. Just to set the mood. I know I'd love to play the whole lot of that, but uh, we've got a show to do. Yeah, so that was 68. So I don't know about you, but I don't reckon music's progressed that much since, uh, since the Beatles, but my, that's my own personal opinion. Tonight we're going to be using the very latest 1968 technology. We've got video on demand available for you. I've been working all day on the word processor, which has been quite interesting. And I was going to bring some handouts for you, but the Ronio machine, we ran out of metho, so unfortunately, you're going to have to just watch it on screen. Um, but we have got the latest data projection technology available for you tonight. So I hope you enjoy that. People, a lot of people are going, yeah, yeah, I remember all that. Yeah, fantastic. So what was happening in Australia in September? John Gorton was that Prime Minister. Henry Bolte was the Premier. And he, had, he had, apparently had some crazy idea that one day he wanted to build a bridge and have his, have his name on it. What an... What an egomaniac. So we had 12 million people in Australia back then. Carlton beat Essendon by three points in the grand final. And the number one song in the charts for 68 was Hey Jude with the flip side, double A side. And I had that, out, that record. And you know what? It was so funny. We bought that record. In fact, my brother bought it. We took it back to the shop because we thought the revolution side had a fuzz on it and we thought something was wrong with the record. <laughs> oh, well. So the median salary was uh, $3,812 and the median house price was 10500 So, what, triple 
the median salary, so three years wages. I think it's a bit more than that these days, the proportion. And Holman Owe would cost you $3,090. And Skippy the Bush Kangaroo came on TV. Fantastic. And I was starting my glorious world beating tennis career. Here I am. And I just saving up my paper round, I'd bought that model. This, I fell in love for the first time. I was uh, inspired by the technology and the humor. I was scared by the Twilight Zone. These guys were pretty good. They just had it. Batman Robin, yes. Jetsons. These guys, yeah, I'm not sure. I was watching the cartoon, The Beatles. And uh, I was in love with Ellie May as well. And uh, Julius Sumner Miller. You remember him? He's fantastic. Why is it so? And of course the Flintstones were on TV. So once again, I don't think things have progressed that much in 2018. Back in the worldwide, the US president was LBJ. We had the Prague Spring, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Uh, LBJ was, was in, in a lot of trouble with Vietnam and what he was going to do. El Martin Luther King was assassinated. And there was student protests about the war and the US and everything uh, um, along that time. Then R Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated as well. So pretty shocking year all around. Then they had the Democratic Convention in Chicago and they, uh, they had a lot of protests, etc. The Boeing 747 was introduced. And of course there was the Olympic protests. In fact, that was uh, one of the Australians uh, involved there as well. He recently passed away, I believe. So let's look at the Apollo, uh, get onto the space stuff. So Apollo uh, 1966, once again, there was a lot of stuff happening, but I've just pulled out a couple of things I thought you find, might, might find interesting. First time we actually saw a fully stacked Saturn V rocket. It was not going to fly, it was a dummy vehicle, but it was used for uh, testing facilities at KSC. They had um, been mating using the platforms and the towers and things like that to test connections, etc., and support equipment. They duplicated their flight uh, configuration. I'm not going to read all these words. You're more than welcome to read them all yourself. Uh, but basically, it was just a, a fit and function test for that. They stacked it on the launcher, uh, and um, and then they had the uh, instrument unit on March the 30th. Um, then they had the command service module on the on the um, on top. So this is some stacking the uh, the 500F vehicle and um, get, the, get the feeling of the dimensions of it. But you see the guys at the bottom here, I'm not sure you can see where I'm pointing over on, the, on this screen, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the guy there. So That stage, I really have no idea, Andrew. That's a good question. So then uh, it was rolled out onto the launch pad, uh, pad 39A on the, May the 25th, and it was rolled back because a hurricane came, and then they put it back on June 10th, which was my birthday, um, they basically culminated in a wet test, so they actually did some fueling of the tanks, etc. So it was a pretty close to, you know, flight ready, I guess, uh, vehicle. So it was pretty impressive. So they used that for doing that, verifying connections. Then it moved off the pad on the October the 14th. Keep note of all these dates, because things were happening so quickly back then. You know, we've been building this SLS for how long, and we haven't even got a bit of... Yeah, yeah. Shepard had just gone up. That's 66, yeah, it's five years. Oh, okay. Do you want me to use the microphone? Oh, okay. All right, no worries. So this is the actual uh, vehicle on the mobile launcher. And once again, you do get a bit of a scale here of the, of the, of the people down there at the bottom of that. And then it went out to the pad. And in fact, they were... At one stage, you're going to build three Apollo pads, A, B, and C. C never got done. But um, it's always good to know if there's a rocket around, whether to slow down or stop or go. I always find. It's not like you'd notice it or anything. Anyway. Five launch pads. Oh, my God. Wow. So this, the 500F was actually on the pad when they, they launched this, I think it was a Titan C. Titan 3C. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, so that went off there. So that was a pretty impressive photograph. 
Um, so they uh, they brought the uh, the stack back inside the VAB, and they started this unique test, which I've never seen before, and I'd be interested to know if they're going to do it with the SLS or other vehicles. I don't know whether they do it with the shuttle or not. But they started this vibration, shaking the actual vehicle um, to test uh, the stability uh, on the launch pad, etc. And in fact, during the test, the escape power top, top, uh, top broke off, uh, but no one was injured. Uh, it was then destacked on the 21st of October. Greetings, welcome. And I do have a video. But uh, apart from the piano at the start. So here they are at the top of the rocket. These guys strapped in and they're just shaking the thing, trying to build up a resonance, you know, a. Um... That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Look at that. So they're testing all of the connections and the stability of the, of the connections. Yeah, so these guys, imagine. Imagine being selected to do that. It's fantastic. And as I say, the, the launch tower top broke off. <laughs> I love it. So was that the, what was that peak comrades or weather testing? They didn't quite get the lightning, did they? But, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you'd like to see that. So um, I do have another video report here, which goes for a little while, but if you're, how are we doing on time? 6.52, it's kind of cool. It's not the full report, but I've just edited it down a bit. We're in final systems installation before entering acceptance testing. The modules were shipped to Cape Kennedy in April, 1966. In block two manufacturing, the inner crew compartment section for the first Block 2 command module was in ultrasonic testing. Sound waves are used to determine the quality of the bond between the aluminum honeycomb reinforcing panels and the underlying aluminum shell. Crew compartment sections for Command Module 103, the first spacecraft to be available for a lunar mission, were in chemical degreasing and etching prior to having reinforcing panels bonded. Degreasing assures a continuous bond of the honeycomb reinforcing structures. A final dip in a sulfuric acid solution etches a slight tooth in the metal. This helps assure a permanent grip of the bonding agents. The third major Apollo spacecraft component is the spacecraft LEM adapter. North American manufactures the adapter at its Tulsa, Oklahoma facility. The 29-foot high adapter is constructed chiefly of aluminum honeycomb sections. Tests were begun at Tulsa to perfect the adapter's panel separation system. In space, the panels will be blown back to permit the extraction of the LEM. Transportation of the first adapter sections from Tulsa to Cape Kennedy was handled by Army helicopters. Adapter number four for the O-11 spacecraft was delivered early in 1966. The 22-foot high lunar excursion module is the fourth major component of the Apollo configuration. It is produced by Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation, Beth Page, Long Island. The LAM subsystems parallel those of the command and service modules. They include an environmental control unit, an alignment optical telescope, and various communication and radar antennas. Storage bays in the module's descent stage will hold scientific equipment that will be used during the lunar stay. A collapsible antenna, for example, will be erected and left on the moon for transmitting scientific data back to Earth. Manufacturing efforts at Grumman were reflected in assembly progress on the first flight-configured ground test article.
The module will be retained at Bethpage as a house development spacecraft. The first flight article LEM, scheduled for an unmanned flight aboard the sixth Saturn 1B launch vehicle, was in structural assembly. It was on schedule for delivery to Cape Kennedy in late 1966. Propulsion ascent stage number two is destined for hot firing tests at NASA's White Sands test facility. The LEM test area at White Sands was completed in early 1965. It contains one ambient pressure stand and two altitude stands. Tests of the facility's steam generating system were begun in February 1966. The equipment successfully produced a simulated altitude of 125,000 feet. The chambers are evacuated by ejecting high pressure steam past the chamber vents. In January 1965, heavyweight ascent stage test rig number three was installed in the ambient pressure stand at White Sands. The rig contains heavyweight tanks, tubing, connections, and fittings for the initial subsystem firing tests. The first firings using the HA-3 test rig and a Bell Aerosystems ascent engine took place in April 1965. Altitude tests of the ascent stage propulsion subsystem will begin at the facility in mid-1966. Development altitude firings of the Bell engine were completed at the Air Force's Tullahoma test facility. Qualification testing of the engine began in April 1966. Developmental firings of the LEM descent engine were conducted by TRW at Tullahoma. And at the company's high altitude test stand, San Juan Capistrano. In support of Apollo development schedules, a number of specialized test facilities have been created. Guidance and navigation equipment is calibrated with the aid of this spacecraft polarity checker. A crew couch vibration tester was used to determine the structural reliability of couch components subjected to launch vibrations. Command module heat shield structures are being subjected to the alternate hot and cold temperature extremes that will be encountered in space in this thermal testing facility. This is a tumbling and cleaning fixture designed to dislodge foreign particles which could become free-floating contaminants during spaceflight. Command module 006 was used in the demonstration test of the fixture. The outdoor pool at Downey was used for continued structural testing. A boilerplate spacecraft fitted with an aft heat shield structure of the type intended for spacecraft 009 was dropped to determine the structure's ability to withstand the most severe conditions of impact angle and velocity anticipated for Apollo. This is a playback of the drop test photographed by high-speed cameras inside the command module. Failure of the heat shield supporting structure resulted in design changes which were successfully demonstrated in later water drop tests. The pool facility was also used to verify the integrity of other command module structures such as the crew tunnel and crew compartment. These scenes show the second of two positions in which the module can stabilize itself in the water, either apex up or apex down, as shown here. To invert an apex down spacecraft, a writing bag system was developed by North American. Block one testing will be completed by mid-1966. Development work of a different sort was underway in perfecting the designs of Apollo lunar mission space suits. Engineering models of the soft suit pressure garment and backpack were delivered by the contractors 
International Latex, Dover, Delaware, for the suit, Hamilton Standard, Windsor Locks, Connecticut, for the backpack. The equipment is part of the Apollo Extravehicular Mobility Unit, which includes an extravehicular visor assembly that can be attached to the helmet. The tinted visors can be used singly or in combination. The latest developmental hard suit for Apollo extended lunar surface investigations and possible deep space applications was also demonstrated. The lightweight aluminum and fiberglass assembly was developed by Lipton Systems Incorporated, Beverly Hills, California. Apollo goals came closer to operational status with the arrival of the first production Apollo spacecraft at the Kennedy Space Center in October 1965. Following an extensive program of inspections, cleaning, build-up, and testing, the mated command and service modules provided the first view of flight-configured Apollo spacecraft modules. On December 26th, the command and service modules and the attached adapter section were mated to the Saturn 1B Launch Vehicle 201 at Launch Complex 34. Saturn Launch Vehicle Development is under the direction of the Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama. Throughout January and February of 1966, pre-flight tests were conducted to ensure every possibility of mission success. The unmanned spacecraft was scheduled to be launched on a 5,000-mile ballistic trajectory down the Atlantic Test Range. The mission would also help confirm the all-up concept of flight testing in which all launch vehicle and spacecraft components will be flown together live for the first time. On launch morning, February 26th, low gaseous control pressures in the launch vehicle forced several recyclings of the countdown and an eventual scrub. However, 10 minutes later, the problem was corrected and the scrub decision was reversed. At 11.12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 26th, Apollo Saturn Mission 201 was on its way. Staging occurred approximately two and a half minutes after launch. The 200,000 pound thrust second stage engine then ignited and propelled the spacecraft to a 310 mile altitude. This was the separation action recorded by an onboard camera. Forty minutes later, the command module landed approximately 43 nautical miles short of its predicted impact point. Recovery was performed by crews aboard the carrier Boxer. Mission objectives included subjecting the command module's heat shield to a fast re-entry heat buildup. Two burns of the service propulsion subsystem accelerated the re-entry speed of the spacecraft so that heat rate buildup approach the values that will be encountered during lunar mission re-entries. Fluctuations in SPS engine firing chamber pressures degraded the entry velocity, resulting in lower surface temperatures than planned. However, data protractions verified that the current heat shield design is able to withstand an atmospheric entry from a lunar mission. The successful completion of the first Apollo Saturn mission was one of the most important accomplishments to date in the development of a manned lunar mission capability. In summary, 
Progress during the reporting period saw Apollo system hardware in manned qualification testing. There were problems, but they were overcome with no distress to overall schedules. Flight article Apollo spacecraft have started to come off the assembly line. And subsystems tests have given way to full-scale flight verification testing. In all levels of Apollo spacecraft activity, program milestones continued to point the way to a scheduled manned lunar landing within this decade. So that was 66, so five years from when Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon. So the amount of progress on all those different areas, incredible. So we, we move forward now to uh, 1967, and um, the, the US was getting ready for its first manned Apollo flight, uh, Apollo 1, on a Saturn 1B with uh, uh, Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chaffee on board. The objective here was to, um, it was originally designated 204, so the first manned Apollo mission. So it was planned to be an orbital, low, low Earth orbital test, uh, and it was scheduled to be launched 21st of February 67. Uh, probably everyone in the room knows what happened there, where it was a fire in the cabin, killed the crew, and um, um, changed the program significantly and put a significant delay in everything. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I think it's well and truly understood. So go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Correct. The block one was the Earth orbit only configuration designed for only Earth orbit. Block two was designed for the deep space uh, lunar missions. So yeah, so the Apollo 1 capsule was a block one. And uh, of course, the changes that came about one of which, of course, was the uh, redesigned hatch, which proved to be completely useless and dangerous for the crew and fatal for the crew on Apollo 1, uh, was modified completely. So as you can see, this is the resultant fire and the damage that took place on the outside of the vehicle. And uh, you can see here, this is a shot once the, uh, the crew had been removed of the inside of the capsule. So um, very tragic, but in many ways, a lot of people have said that um, Apollo 1 actually was was a key su to success of the Apollo program subsequently because they sorted out so many issues and so many problems. If the fire had happened in space or out at the moon, they would have very little understanding of what exactly went wrong and all those issues. So um, very sad, obviously very sad, but um, it imposed a necessary break on the program, slow them down, re-evaluate re what they're doing. And, um, and move on from there. So that was 67, 1967, January. Um, there were some other things still happening in 67, and uh, I've got a video here uh, that talks about uh, what happened uh, in one area, which was quite exciting. This only goes for a short period of time. Ashley, you got a problem? Here's the big shot, the ride without astronauts of the giant Saturn V rocket. Project Apollo. This is Apollo 4, the test of our moon rocket in flight for the first time. It is the beginning, the first of many steps which will someday put men on the surface of the moon. Good morning. Behind me is the largest single object man has ever attempted to lift off the face of the Earth. Its official designation is Saturn V. It stands as tall as a 36-story building, and though it is unmanned for this flight, this is the monster rocket which ultimately will place men on the moon. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 5, 4, we have ignition. All engines are running. We have liftoff. We have liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The 
tower has... My God, a building shaking here. A building shaking. The building's shaking. This big glass window is shaking. Now we're holding it with our hands. Look at that rocket go into the clouds at 3,000 feet. The roar is terrific. Look at it going. You can see it. You can see it. Part of our roof is coming here. I don't know if you can hear, ladies 46. and gentlemen, but all the flight is moving along as it should be. But our observation, the NBC observation booth, is literally being shaken apart. Our tape recorders seconds. are being thrown to the floor by the roar of this mighty rocket as it continues to climb into the sky on its seven and a half our billion pounds of thrust. It minute is a beautiful sight, an unbelievable sight. There's just never been anything like it. The Titan II that powered Gemini, the Mercury Atlas that uh, powered John Glenn in our early orbital flights, they looked impressive at the time. But not until you felt your flesh vibrate and your desk lift and your body thunder with the vibration from that rocket going could you sense the excitement. It's just been, and it worked better the first time than anything we've ever used. The spacecraft is now well into its first revolution around the Earth and a star flight well underway. Frank? Thank you very much, Jules. I know you've had a very pleasant morning. Well, Apollo 4 is on the way, and the mission apparently seems to be going well. I think uh, for NASA and for America's space program, you can say, oh, what a beautiful morning this has been. This is Frank Reynolds in New York. Yeah, apparently it shook the uh, booth apart in the uh, NBC um, broadcast facilities at, at, at the Kennedy Space Center there. So we move on uh, into 68. Yes. That's, that's correct, yes. We'll talk about that very shortly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They put one on a Saturn 1B and then later on on a Saturn 5. So yeah, yeah. So just a few things. Well, obviously a lot of things happened and I had to pare things down. So January 7, 10, when that surveyor landed, reached the lunar surface. Here's the answer to your question. Saturn 1B rocket launches up unmanned uh, Apollo 5 with a lunar module, a testing lunar module on board. And that's the vehicle right there. So this is 65, sorry, 68. So there it is being hoisted up onto the 1B in its mating adapter. You notice it doesn't need legs on it, but they figure they didn't need legs. And uh, there's the launch of uh, Apollo 5. And once again, I could have videos of all these and we'd be here until 6 o'clock in the morning. So. Um, so in March, uh, the few things were happening with the crew assignments. Uh, uh, Apollo 9 backup crew members Neil Armstrong and Buzz were conducting lunar module system tests. Um, they were in line for the prime crew of Apollo 12 at this stage. And, um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff happening relating to um, the um, Saturn V boosters as well. I think I might have got something slightly out of order. So this is Neil and Buzz uh, doing some testing on uh, on LM4 in March of 68. So once again, they are in line for Apollo 12. This is um, the one of the mock-up uh, lunar modules, uh, lunar module um, um, test article. Um, and this was going to be on Apollo 6. So this is a Saturn V. Um, and their plan there was to send uh, uh, the command service module plus a lunar test article uh, in a, uh, um, into a translunar trajectory. Now, at the time, the moon would not be in the right position, so what they decided to do is to modify it and use the service propulsion engine to, um, to slow the spacecraft up and bring it back to Earth and um, simulate a direct abort uh, scenario. So we've got a bit of 
video of this guy. This is... T minus 30 seconds and counting. Number one swing arm now being retracted from the Saturn V vehicle. 25 seconds and counting. T minus 20, still counting at this time. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have liftoff. Liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Five seconds into the flight. We're looking good. We have cleared the tower. We have Under cleared the tower. Under Sam Tower, Chris, Houston Center assumes control. Pitch and roll program started. Our vehicle going now to an azimuth heading of 72 degrees. All five F1 engines fine. Uh, looking good. They're given a green light at this time from range safety. Completed now. Pitch profile still in progress. Uh, 40 seconds. Mark 45 seconds. Our vehicle well beyond the beach now. Our IP impact point uh, moving out well over water as desired. Mark 56 seconds. Our cabin pressure is relieving. Coming down now from a pad bay 16 pounds per square inch. Looking good. Within a reasonable time, we're going to pass fast forward this uh, um, video for a little while so we can get it all done. There. Can someone see what number's up there? Is that five? Mark, one minute, 25 seconds. Uh, pass through Max Q, still looking good. Now, 10 nautical miles in altitude, heading out beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, we're on our way. I had to fast forward just for interest of brevity. Mark, uh, 7 minutes 45 seconds. Uh, we have a preliminary report of a loss of two engines. Uh, this would be engines 2 and 3. However, uh, our guidance is holding well and we're standing by. Our hydraulics are good, reports booster. Uh, we'll stand by for further confirmation of that report. Uh, this is only a preliminary report at this time. Eight minutes, ten seconds of the flight. Booster reports at the t this time we're looking go. So we're standing by at eight minutes, twenty-eight seconds of the flight. Our vehicle now 101 nautical miles in altitude. 780 nautical miles downrange. Booster reports our third stage looks good. Uh, we're at uh, 8 minutes uh, 52 seconds now into the flight. Altitude 1,000. Okay, so the vehicle did make it to orbit, however, there were some problems. So there was pogo oscillation, which didn't happen on the uh, earlier Saturn V uh, launch, and uh, it caused some damage to the engines in the second stage, resulting two of them shutting down. So, um, but once again, they were able to burn longer, and the guidance system took over and was able to get, to, um, get it up to orbit. So basically, that, um, that was a big problem. So they had to go ahead and delay some other testing that was on at the uh, Marshall test facility, a uh, Michoud test facility, um, to make sure that they understood what was going on there. So once again, April 68, right? Still haven't flown anyone on board, and uh, a lot of things are happening. So Neil was out at the Grumman plant checking out Apollo 9's lunar module. Uh, once again, he was serving as backup commander at this stage. April 27, like right? That was a, just a couple of weeks after the launch of Apollo uh, 6. Um, they approve a plan to put people on the Saturn V. Uh, he based the decision on the, in, the fact that the engineers were able to understand what the problem was and they were able to fix it. 
So April 24, the mission flew, and April 27, they go through all the nuts and bolts working out what happened and put, put people on. That's, that's, that's gutsy. So then May 6, uh, over in Texas, Neil Armstrong was practicing his landing techniques in the lunar landing uh, um, research vehicle, and he bent it big time. Um, so, yeah, so you've probably seen that in other scenarios, but uh, this is what's happening. He was flying along, and um, they had a problem with uh, the control system, I believe, or one of the thrusters was broken. Anyway, he pitched over significantly, and he punched out, uh, managing to save his, save his life. The vehicle didn't come off so well, but um, he uh, gained a lot of uh, experience of uh, quick thinking there. So once again, July 68. Um, so they conducted some tests with the modifications that they had come up with to, to uh, mitigate the pogo problem, and um, and uh, they managed to, to run those uh, well and um, and get some comfort with what was happening. Now, I'm going to start looking at the actual vehicles that are going to be flying on Apollo 11. So July 1968, the Apollo 11 command module is under construction in California. Um, in this particular picture, it hasn't got its heat shield on, on or anything like that, but it's uh, going, undergoing systems checks. Once again, this is all post. And once again, I skipped over a lot of details. Obviously, as a result, result of the Apollo 1 fire, there was a big inquiry, a lot of design changes to the uh, systems and the command module. Those have all been implemented and being built into the Apollo 11 and other manned Apollo Block 2 uh, vehicles. Once again, July 68, um, surgeons removed um, a bone spur from Neil, Mike Collins' neck um, and they feel that he's going to be offline for, for a while. He was scheduled to be the command module pilot on the third Apollo mission in early 69, but he was grounded from that. Um, they were not really sure whether he was even going to be able to fly. Um, so he did return later to flight status and became a uh, backup on Apollo 8. So once again, uh, there were some more static firing tests, once again confirming the changes that they'd made to the engines and the boosters to get rid of that pogo was going to be, um, was going to be um, proven and, uh, and it all performed as planned. So. Uh, so that, was, that was good. August 14, this is interesting stuff. Um, they had a meeting, a secret meeting, well, non-public meeting, um, with uh, Thomas Paine, Sam Phillips uh, were there, uh, James Webb and uh, George Miller were in Vienna at the time, and um, they discussed the feasibility of, of, um, of uh, George, George Lowe, I think it was, who uh, had proposed a uh, uh, an Apollo 8 circumlunar mission, as opposed to just the Earth orbit with a lunar module, one that they were originally planning on doing, um, because a lunar module was running behind schedule. Um, so they had some further discussions, uh, and Webb uh, agreed for the plan for December 6th, uh, despite a more suitable, I don't know, December 20, I don't know what the deal is there, maybe lighting, etc. But they wouldn't make the decision on that until they got a, a manned Apollo flight off the ground and it worked correctly, which was going to be Apollo 7's uh, task next month, October. Remember, we're September 68 here tonight. Okay, August 19. Uh, so they announced uh, that the lunar module was going to be dropped from the Apollo 8 mission, as was advertised to the public previously. Um, at that stage, they didn't mention the fact that they were thinking about sending Apollo 8 around the moon. Um, so Apollo 8's uh, um, lunar module was going to be pushed onto Apollo 9. So as a result of that, they modified the crew assignments because uh, um, because um, the Apollo, well, original Apollo 8 crew were going to be taking the lunar module out uh, with Jim McDivitt and Dave Scott and Rusty Swigert. They swapped those around, swapped the crews around and uh, assigned them to Apollo 8 and Apollo 9 respectively. Um, so then the new backup crew for Apollo is Neil Armstrong, Buzz, and Fred Hay at that stage. Once again, August 1968. So this is Fred and uh, Neil doing some um, testing and training. I'm not sure what exactly what they've got going in an altitude chamber or something of that sort. Um, the Apollo 11, once again, lunar module was under construction. 
in uh, New York. And um, the boosters that have been tested um, previously, uh, the, the vehicle that's going to be used for Apollo 11 was tested, hot fired, and then was moved back to, uh, to for post uh, checkout, post firing checkout. And then they're checking it out, making sure it was functioning correctly, checking all the systems were working okay, et cetera, et cetera. That's September. So we're back into September 68. Uh, over at uh, the test facility, the, the second stage vehicle uh, booster was up on the stand, uh, about to be tested. And another little thing that happened at, once again, as I say, a million things in parallel happening, but another thing that was happening was this um, test on September 4. There was three Air Force uh, officers assigned to NASA, and they put on suits and got into uh, a test command module and closed the hatch and conducted a 125-hour test in that thing. Um, so uh, they modified the temperature, they did a whole bunch of things, and in fact, they depressurized and opened the door for an hour or so to simulate a spacewalk, and then closed it up and repressurized all in this uh, containment environment. So this is, uh, this is in 1G, mind you. So like everyone says in 0G, you've got a lot more room, but 1G, you're just sitting there in this little room size of a Volkswagen Beetle, so well, but bigger than that. So would have been a big task. I'm not sure whether they got overtime pay. So, um, so these guys, uh, Lindsay, Rita, and Davidson, they emerged. They've got they're pretty happy to be out. This is the three guys there. Um, I don't know whether they ever spoke to each other again after that. I'm not quite certain. I haven't got a record of that. Uh, but it performed really well. So once again, this was a real certifying test for the uh, for the Apollo Command module in preparation. Uh, for the upcoming uh, Apollo 7 mission. Now, meanwhile, the the stack was on the pad, pad 34 in the Cape Canaveral Cape, Cape Air Force Station, and the crew were undergoing um, various uh, training and tests and a countdown demonstration test. Here's Walt Cunningham uh, working on the working with the flight uh, the slide wire system, and there's um, Wally Shira standing by there helping out. Um, and that's once again, this is a countdown demonstration test on the pad. And I've got a little bit of silent video, but I think you might find it interesting. I you rarely see this uh, video, but basically this is during the countdown demonstration test um, where they suit up, they do everything they would do on launch day, get in the van, go out, get put into the vehicle, shut the door, pressure up, do the tests, et cetera, et cetera, and then go to a simulated launch. Now, in this particular case, they also did a simulated emergency uh, egress training. So basically they said, right, you guys are in. Okay, there's a fire, you guys, or something's happened. You guys have got to get out. They had to do it all themselves. So this is some video, or some film, not video, film of them uh, doing that. So they're, they're just about to shut the, the hatch. This is the new hatch that was modified after Apollo one and so there's the hatch coming open i think i'd be moving a bit faster than that if it was real but i guess they're just being super cautious making sure that they're uh, getting unstrapped and all that kind of stuff i think uh, if it was a real emergency adrenaline would be making you move much faster than that but yeah yeah, up to you. Huh? Up to you. Okay, so he's just been there to monitor for safety, but he obviously wouldn't be there on a real emergency on launch day. So they come out. They've unplugged their suits from the from the air system. So they're basically breathing the ambient air within the suit at the moment. So they've got to fix that pretty quickly. So they go over and get these portable uh, uh, oxygen packs, whack it around their neck. Has anyone seen this video before? Pretty cool, isn't it? I tell you, what, I spent so many hours getting this preparation, this, this presentation ready, and the amount of stuff I've had to leave on the cutting room floor. I think you might. 
Well, you're probably running while you're doing that, but anyway. So then they've got these um, armoured personnel carriers that they, or the protected personnel carriers, they come down the lift. So it looks like there's a shower of water coming over there as they run out. Can't get it started. Oh yeah. So pretty heavily insulated the outside of that uh, that unit. That van is in the visitor centre at the Kennedy Space Centre now. If you want to go and watch it, go and have a look at it. Whee! Or maybe not. So that'd be a pretty interesting ride in that big bulky spacesuit, but I suppose if your life depended on it, you'd be pretty motivated to jump. And some publicity photos for the press. So once again, we are now in September 68. Next month, we're going to see if Apollo 7 works. So while that was happening in September, the Apollo 8 crew were uh, were doing some training and some testing and simulated flight altitude chamber testing with their spacecraft. So that's Jim Lovell over here, Bill Anders and um, Frank Borman down there. So what else was happening in October 68? Well, that's next month, remember. We're going to have the Mexico Olympics. The Beatles are finishing their album, the White Album, which will be due for release in November. The Monkees just to complete the tour of Australia. And Barbarella is going to be released. Is that right? Fantastic. All right, so next month we're going to be looking at Apollo 7. So it'll be the first crewed Apollo space mission. And it'll be the first US uh, manned flight since Gemini 12 in November 66. So obviously Apollo 1 didn't get anywhere in January uh, 67. So it's been well, almost two years uh, since uh, the US has had uh, anyone up in space. So they're targeting launch for October 11. So we'll see how they go, see how the weather goes. So the primary objectives will be to obviously test the command service module and the performance of the crew, um, mission support facilities, etc. And uh, the command service module rendezvous capability so that's the objectives of that test and also uh, in October um, the guys up at Honeysuckle Creek um, they had been tracking Apollo 4, 5 and 6 and they sort of were working with the manned space, uh, manned space flight network which they're, which they're a part of uh, and that required them liaising heavily with Houston etc um, and acquiring and tracking spacecraft in Earth orbit 
Uh, but really, Hardin Sackle Creek was really designed for more of a deep space tracking station. Uh, but they were doing work to verify their equipment uh, on those other missions and including Apollo 7. So it's going to be the first opportunity for really to test out the hardware. Uh, September this month, actually, Al Shepard came out and visited Honeysuckle Creek, um, and that's Tom Reed. Now, for people who are interested in Tom Reed, there is a book coming out about Tom Reed later this year. Uh, I had a chat with the author. I can't remember his name right now. Mike, do you remember? Anyway, we'll have details about that when it comes out. Um, so it would be quite fascinating. Really. Tom Reed, Australian. Yeah. So this is interesting. This is a picture from, uh, if you ever get a chance and get a, a, a free afternoon, go to the honeysucklecreek.net website. There's a wealth of stuff. And this is a picture of an interesting picture, once again, in September of 68. And they were um, basically using their equipment and calibrating their equipment to track moving objects. And what they did, they had a, a super, NASA super constellation aircraft set up and they were using the dish to track and follow the uh, the aircraft around and they had a transmitter on there to simulate space uh, derived uh, telemetry so pretty fascinating stuff they had a lot of good stuff going on up there so we'll see you at our next meeting godspeed apollo 7 and let's see how they go and that is the end of that little segment and i think i'm on time see if we've got any questions Thank you. Am I on time, Mike? Good grief. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, as I say, there was so much stuff I had to leave out. Um, you know, there was stuff happening in the, in the space suits, in the uh, tracking, in the, you know, or any area you can think of. And I just tried to pull out a few things that I thought people might find interesting. Um, there's a wealth of stuff out there on YouTube and things. If you go to the NASA films and things, it's like you could just... Uh, you could uh, spend the rest of your life looking at it. But I um, hope you enjoyed tonight. Um, it's going to be a series, as I mentioned at the start. Every month between now and July, we're going to be doing this, or myself or maybe somebody else. Um, might, may not be quite as long and detailed as this one because we had to catch up, remember, from 66 to September 68. So now we're just going to be looking at October 68 next month, November, December, January, et cetera, et cetera, as we go. So uh, I guess the overall thing is that I want to impress some people is just the phenomenal pace and decision making that was going on even in the face of astronauts being killed and stuff blowing up and things there was just so many things just moving forward and pushing forward uh, that it really is quite incre incredible and that decision to go ahead with apollo 8 uh, so soon after the pogo issues they'd had to put people on the saturn 5 just an example of of the uh, the, the go for it attitude and the confidence they had and keep in mind, they were using slide rules and that sort of stuff. They weren't simulating things with supercomputers back then. So draw blueprints, slide, slide rules, and um, one fundamental.